coming up on The Overcoming Life with Jimmy Evans. It has never been about you. It's not about you, and it never will be about you or me. Pride says it's about me. The focus is on me. The focus is about me getting my way. It was about him. It is about him. It always will be about him. Let's humble ourselves and make our lives about him. Moses died when he was 120 years old. He was 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in the wilderness, and for for 40 years, he led the children of Israel through the wilderness, but before he got in, he died because of the punishment that God put on him because of this event. Numbers 20, verse one. The children of Israel, the whole congregation, came to the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation, so they gathered together against Moses and Aaron, and the people contended with Moses and spoke, saying, if only we had died with our brethren when our brethren died before the Lord. Why have you brought up this assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we and our animals should die here? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? Is, it, it is not a place of grain or figs or vine or pomegranates, nor is there any water to drink. So Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, And they fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together, speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock, and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him, and Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels. Must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod. And water came out abundantly in the congregation, their animals drank. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe me to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. This was the water of Meribah because the children of Israel contended with the Lord and he was hallowed among them. Now, You notice here, and since we have been talking about Moses and the children of Israel getting out of Egypt, you notice every time there's a problem, the children of Israel accuse God because they see God through Pharaoh. Pharaoh was the first God they knew. Pharaoh was a father figure to Moses. And so in Egypt, they learned that gods were difficult and angry and austere and were to be feared. That's what they learned in Egypt. And the purpose of the wilderness was to get that off of them before they went into the promised land. God did not want them to possess the promised land with a concept that God was a, an angry God. So there was a rock that followed them through the wilderness. From the, and we'll read about it more in just a minute. This rock that Moses was speaking to was a moving rock. It followed them everywhere they went through the wilderness, and God was using this rock to show the children of Israel, I'll take care of you even when you're in rebellion. Every day, the children of Israel for 40 years received manna. Every day, regardless whether it was a good day or a bad day. Every day for 40 years, God brought water from that rock to water the children of Israel on a good day or a bad day. And see, what he's trying to teach them is, I'm not like Pharaoh, I'm a God of grace. My love for you is not based on performance. My love for you is based on the fact that I love you. But, but Moses blows it here. In his anger, God told him to speak to the rock, and he was trying to use this as an opportunity to help the people understand I'm a God of grace. I'm not gonna punish you every time you do something wrong. But Moses blows it, and he gets on top of the rock, and he takes the rod and strikes the rock twice and yells at the people. So literally, rather than helping the people understand the grace of God, all Moses did was reinforce to the people that God was an angry God and an austere God, and he was like the gods of Egypt. So that's the reason that God said to Moses, you're you're not getting in. But God said to Moses, because you did not believe me to hallow me. That's an interesting word, hallow. You did not hallow me. And that word in the Hebrew is the word kadesh. And it means to sanctify or to consecrate. 
And to understand the, the word hallow, it means to reveal God accurately. It means to be a, a good example of how God is. And that's what a leader, that's what a pastor should be. That's what a leader should be. That's what a parent should be. Is we should be proper representations of the nature of God. And so God is saying to Moses, you got on top of that rock in anger and you yelled at the people and that did not represent my grace and my love. And because of that, you're not getting into the land. And so this is a very, very significant event, obviously, in the life of Moses. And I want to answer, kind of ask and answer a question. And the question is, why was God so angry with Moses? After all the years that Moses had faithfully led the children of Israel, why, why was God so severe with Moses? I just want to say kind of parenthetically, when you're 120 years old, I think it was actually a blessing he didn't get in. You know, I mean, I think it was really a, kind of a blessing he didn't have to do what Joshua did because there was a lot to do to get the people into the land and Joshua was, was a younger man and he was prepared to do that. And by the way, Moses did get into the land because in the New Testament, he was on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus and Elijah. And so we know Moses eventually got into the land, but he died in the wilderness. And the question is, why was God so severe with Moses? Number one, Moses misused his authority and power. Remember the rod represented authority and power? Listen to me. God gives us authority and power for his kingdom purposes, not our selfish purposes. And Moses was ticked off. Moses was angry. And in his anger, he took the authority and power of God and he misused it for his own selfish purposes. That's the first reason. The second reason was Moses took credit for providing the water. This is, this, he robbed God of his glory. And it's like God supernaturally doing something and then you say, I did that. Moses stood on top of the rock and he said, must I bring water? Must we, uh, Aaron and I, must we bring water for you out of the rock? He's not giving God any credit at all. He's kind of taking on to himself that he is the provider of all of this water. And then thirdly, Moses rebelled against God as he hypocritically called the children of Israel rebels. He's in rebellion when he's calling them rebels. And so, and this is what hypocrisy does. You know, you're doing something that you're, you're, you're judging other people for doing what you're, you're doing in the eyes of God. And Jesus hated, you know, Jesus never preached against the Romans. Jesus just didn't have a problem. I mean, not that he liked the Romans, but Jesus didn't have any problem because the Romans were the Romans. They didn't pretend to be anything else. But Jesus had a huge problem with the religious leaders of his day. And he called them hypocrites, which means a play actor. Someone who's pretending to be something that they're not. And so Moses is a hypocrite. He's standing up here, uh, you know, appearing to be Holy Joe, but he is in the same boat they are. He's in rebellion to God. And there's nothing more, there's nothing more disheartening than someone telling you something is wrong while they're doing it. You know, hypocrisy is a very dangerous thing. You know, it, we have a tendency to sympathize with our issues and judge other people's. And Moses is very sympathetic with his anger and his frustration. And when he rebels against God and gets up on that rock and starts striking that rock, he justifies it. But he looks at these people. Listen, these people have been for 400 years in Egypt. They don't know any better. They literally don't know any better. God is merciful with them because he's trying to get the Pharaoh filter off their eyes. He's trying to get Egypt out of the people. He got the people out of Egypt. Now he's trying to get Egypt out of the people and he's literally trying to love, love it out of them. In spite of their rebellion, in spite of their accusations, you know, when we get saved, God gets us out of the world, but it takes a while to get the world out of us. Did you know that? And the way God does it is he loves it out of us. He doesn't scare it out of us, he loves it out of us. Aren't you glad that we have such a gracious God? He is a gracious God. So Moses strikes the rock and God says, you're not getting into the promised land. Well, when I talk about the promised land here from this point forward, I'm not talking about your salvation, I'm not talking about baptism in the Holy Spirit, I'm not talking about the essentials of the faith, I'm talking about that place in our lives which is the place of fullness, our destiny. And what I want to say is the issue with Moses not getting into the promised land is a principle not just specific to Moses. And that is, if you want to get to your promised land, you have to care how your life reflects on God. God said to Abraham, I'm going to use you as a select people. God doesn't love Israel more than he loves anybody else. But he used, he used them in a unique way. And I'm going to use you to bless the earth. God wants to use your life to bless people, 
God wants to bless you so profoundly that other people see how good God is. Let your light so shine that other people will see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. The purpose for Israel was to glorify God. The purpose of the promised land was to glorify God, to bless God's people, but the first purpose was to glorify God, and it rarely happened. That's why Israel lost the promised land two times. Israel had a tough time in the promised land because when they got there, they just took it for granted and they used it for their own purposes and they lived very immoral lives. You really only see one time in Israel's history where Israel became what God intended. It was during the days of Solomon. During the days of Solomon, they they built the glorious temple. Uh, The the nation of Israel was the top of the earth. The kings of the earth came to Israel to see the glory of God and the glory of Solomon. That's why God created Israel, so that he could hallow himself through them to the world. It really only happened a few times. A little bit in David's time, in Solomon's time, but then Solomon fell. But two times they lost the promised land. I'm, I'm saying this to you. God has a promised land for you. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm not talking about healing. I'm not talking about baptism of the Holy Spirit. Those are all great things God does by his grace. I'm talking about you reaching your destiny. And for you to reach your destiny, there has to come a place where we care what other people think about God through us. Have you felt overwhelmed by the challenges of life? The secret to overcoming stress and worry is living in God's presence. He'll guide you and help you overcome every negative emotion you experience. This series, Living in God's Presence, uses the life of Moses to show you how to possess your promised land and know God intimately. We wanna get this series into your hands and today we have an offer that will help take you deeper into your relationship with God. With your gift of any amount, we'll send you the Living in God's Presence series on CD or as an audio download. And with your gift of $50 or more, you can receive the Living in God's Presence series on DVD or as a video download. Plus, receive Jimmy's life-changing book, 10 Steps Towards Christ, a practical resource that will help you overcome old habits and mindsets in order to rely on God. You don't have to live with stress and anxiety. Start your journey of intimate friendship with God today. This is Jesus in the Lord's Prayer. They said, Lord, teach us how to pray. Jesus said, in this manner, therefore pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Remember that word, hallow? And God says to Moses, because you didn't hallow me, and they come to Jesus and they said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And Jesus said, well, here's the first thing I want you to say when you pray. Father in heaven is God's name and address. That's not a prayer. That's just specifying. We're not just lobbing a prayer up to anybody who's listening. Okay? We're specifying we have a Father in heaven, and I'm addressing this prayer to you. Number one prayer, hallowed be your name. Many, I didn't know what the word hallow meant. For many years, I prayed that prayer. I thought, what does hallow mean? You know, little Johnny went to Sunday school class one day, and he went to Sunday school class, and the teacher said, class, does anybody know God's name? And little Johnny raised his hand, and she said, little Johnny, and he said, God's name is Harold. And the teacher said, little Johnny, why in the world would you say that God's name is Harold? She said, he, he said, because every day I hear my mama pray, Father in heaven, Harold be your name. And... <laughs> And that's silly, but really and truly, for most of us, we don't know what the word hallow means. The word hallow means to sanctify. L- listen to me. Here's the way I pray that prayer, because here's what it means. I want to see you for who you really are, and if there's any misconceptions I have about you, I want you to take them away. And I want to reveal you to other people accurately today. That's what hallow means. Hallow means I don't want any bugs on the windshield. I want to be able to see you without any blemish of my past getting in the way. And when people look at my life, I want my life to be a clean windshield that they can look through my life and see the nature of God. Jesus said, that's the first thing you should pray every day. Hallow your name. Hallow your name in my life. And so this this is the difference maker. This is the difference maker in our lives. And it's first of all, it's the difference between spiritual maturity and immaturity. When you look at children, the the dangerous thing about children is they have no social awareness whatsoever. So when you take them in public, you're taking a big risk and you know it. (laughs) They have no concept 
of how their behavior would reflect upon their family or upon God. That's spiritually immature people. See, like Moses got angry, okay? Moses is ticked off, he's frustrated with the children of Israel, they're a pain in the neck, and in his anger, he gets up on the rock and throws a tantrum. Well, we get angry, don't we? You get angry in traffic? You get angry with your family, you get angry at work, you get angry at school, we all get, ang we get angry, don't we? Okay. But the, qu the question isn't, are we human, because we're all human, Moses was human. But the question is this, is there gonna be a point in my life where I realize that my behavior is a reflection upon God and I don't have the right as a believer to do what other people can do? I don't have that right. Why? Because my, my life reflects upon Christ. This is the difference maker. This, this is the difference maker. If you're spiritually immature people, just don't get it. They just don't understand that we're Christians and other people judge Christ because of our lives. We don't have to be perfect. We don't have to be plastic or holy Joes, but we just have to remember the way we respond is telling some people something about our faith and about our God. Mature people, mature adults understand my behavior reflects on my family. My behavior reflects upon Karen. My behavior reflects upon my children and my grandchildren. But more than anything else, my behavior reflects upon Christ. And for that reason, I can't act any way I want to act. It's the difference between God's assistance or his resistance. James 4. He gives more grace, therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of God, sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. This is talking about the difference between humility and pride. See, pride is just about me. It's just all about me. The only thing that matters is me and me getting my way. And Moses gets up on the rock and the only thing that matters is is that he's having a little temper tantrum and he's gonna show everybody how tough he is. Literally, that's all he was doing. He was trying to intimidate the children of Israel and let them know you better not mess with me, okay? Humility says this, it's not about me, it's about you. Did you know something? When we get to heaven, no one's gonna worship Jimmy. There's no man worship in heaven. If you'll read your Bible carefully, when we get to heaven, we worship him and him alone. It's not about, it has never been about you, it's not about you, and it never will be about you or me. Pride says it's about me. The focus is on me. The focus is about me getting my way. It was about him, it is about him, it always will be about him. Let's humble ourselves and make our lives about him. And God's humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. He will get you to your promised land. He will exalt you. Here's another way to say that. Give God what he wants, he'll give you what you want. What does he want? He wants to be glorified in the sight of the nations. He wants to be glorified in our neighborhoods. He wants to be glorified in our businesses. And he's looking for someone who cares how their lives reflect upon Christ. And this is a big question. Are your relationships about Jesus or you, honestly? Why do you choose the friends that you choose? Why do you hang out with the people you hang out with? Is it about you or God? And I'm saying in my own life, it's about God. I've lost friends. I lost every friend I had the day I got saved. My relationships are not about me having friends first. My relationships are about me glorifying God first and doing God's will for my life. What's your business about? Is it about making money or is it about expanding the kingdom of God and glorifying God? And here's what I'm saying. When you get to that point, because we're all selfish, we're all naturally selfish. No one wakes up and does this thing right. It, all of us have to get to a point where something shifts in our lives. But to get to that place where God is not resisting the pride and the arrogance, like in Moses' case, but is assisting and we humble ourselves and he exalts us, we get to a place in our lives that says, every relationship in my life is first of all about you. My business is first of all about you. 
The way I use the talents and gifts in my life is first of all about you. There just comes a point in time that we have to understand that our behavior reflects upon God. This is Romans 2. It says, you who say do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? It's talking about hypocrisy. You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. You know, I know there are people who don't like me because I'm a believer. I know, I know that for sure. But they don't like me because of my beliefs. But my prayer every day is, let my actions reveal your nature. And let me tell you something, he's a gracious God. I wanna be gracious to people. I wanna be kind to people. People who don't deserve it. People who are like me before I got saved. I was, I was with a guy this week, and he's a funny guy. And uh, I like him. And uh, he's a very successful guy. He's real, he's dirty. And he came up to me and said something to me. And he was, he, you know, he was just being a guy. And he said something to me, and he knows who I am. He said it, and it was just kind of dirty. And he walked off, and I thought, he's exactly that way I was before I got saved. And he's going to get saved. Amen. And I didn't sit there acting like I was a holy Joe who had never thought anything like what he had said. As he walked off, I just thought, but by the grace of God, that would be me. And dear God, help me to lead that man to Christ and show him your love in the meantime, like somebody did for me. Our lives reflect upon God. The, the last thing is, it makes the difference of whether or not we'll possess our promised land. You can be saved, baptized in the Holy Spirit, blessed in many ways. But really and truly, this is the key to the promised land. This is the promised land problem. It's why Moses didn't get in and it's why the children of Israel lost the promised land twice. It's because they just never got it that their lives were to hollow God. You're special. You're made in the image of God and God has a plan for your life. You don't have to do one thing for God to love you. You really don't. You're loved. You can be saved by grace. You, don't, you can't perform your way into salvation or any of the blessings of God. But there's a place in your life. It's your destiny. It's the, it's the promised land. It's the fullness. And there is a condition to it. And the condition to our promised land is just simply... It's about God before it's about me. And I humble myself in the sight of the Lord. And I make it about Him. And I'm believing that He will lift me up. You know, when the Lord punished Moses for striking the rock, He didn't get to go into the promised land. And you think, well, you know, that's a really severe punishment that God, you know, put on Moses for striking the rock. Well, I tell you this, there is a severe punishment for pride. And that's just the reality of it. When, when you walk in pride, you know, the Bible says God resists the proud, and that means to set yourself in battle formation against. When we're walking in pride, it means we're not gonna succeed. There, there's, a, there's a huge penalty when we walk in pride because the opposite of pride is humility, and pride says, I don't need God, I'll do this myself, and you strike the rock and you take credit for things that, that God should be getting credit for, and you just kind of push your chest out and say, I don't need God, I've got, I've got this rod here, and I'm gonna rule over everybody in my life. And that's pride. Humility says, I need you. It's not me who creates the water and provides, it's God that provides. It's not me who has the right to lord over you, only God has that right. It's a completely different way of living. In the, you know, James 4 says, God Resist the proud, strong, strong, strong word there. Resist the proud, but it gives grace to the humble. Well, what does that mean? It means grace means everything you need for free. When you're humble, humility says something that pride won't say. And this is the prayer God loves. I need you. That's, the, that's God's favorite prayer. I need you. There's an independence within us. Isaiah says that all we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has gone to our own way. But the Lord has called the, caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him, Jesus. Jesus died to forgive us for our independence and rebellion and pride. And the way that we experience the blessings of God is to repent. And repent means change our minds. We go to God and say, I need you. I need you. I'm not my own God. I'm not my own boss. I'm not my own provider. I don't have the right to rule over people and to mistreat them. 
Well, Moses misused his authority. He misused his position and he became prideful and God punished him. Well, God's a forgiving God and he forgave Moses. Remember G Moses and Elijah showed up with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, so it's all good with Moses. But the reality of it is, even though we're saved on our way to heaven, we need to be careful to repent of pride. Don't walk in pride, but walk in humility. We become spiritually mature. God blesses us and we get our promised land. It's one of the greatest secrets of living the overcoming life. God bless you. The secret to overcoming stress and worry is living in God's presence. He'll guide you and help you overcome every challenge. In this powerful series, Living in God's Presence, Jimmy Evans will help you discover how to know God, the authority you have over the enemy, and how to possess your promised land. There's a rock following you, and his name is Jesus. And he'll be there for the rest of your life, and he'll always give you what you need. Support the overcoming life with your gift of any amount, and we'll send you the complete series, Living in God's Presence, on CD or audio download. Receive the complete series, Living in God's Presence, on DVD or video download, and Jimmy Evans' book, 10 Steps Towards Christ, for your gift of $50 or more. The 10 Steps Toward Christ book gives you practical steps to navigate your new life in Christ. The Lord will help you solve every problem, meet every need, and conquer every enemy. Receive this life-changing series today. Thank you for watching The Overcoming Life with Jimmy Evans.